The opinions expressed in this show are the views of the host and not necessarily that of WTRW, 94.3 The Talker, or the Bold Gold Media Group. The following presentation is brought to you by the host of the program who is solely responsible for its content. Good afternoon. Welcome to Make a Change. I'm your host, Terry Martin, along with my producer, D.C. Taylor, and the show is all about you and how to make a change. And that is why I have David Madeira, and I am so honored to have you on our show today, because I get, should I say, intimidated by you. And one of the reasons that I do is, before we even begin very much, I'd like to know why they say that you're a narcissist. Well, and actually, yeah, that's a funny evolution, and thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk on Make I'm a Change. Honored. I'm honored. I'm a big fan of the show. I like how you focus on people. Uh, much of what I do focuses on policies and politics, and it's the ugly side. And what you talk about is people who make a change, who do something different with their lives. And really, I think that's the future. I'm sort of stuck in the present, but you're talking about the future. But I... I I got the the title narcissist because shortly after my show started, um, because I'm not generally people who know me don't think of me as a narcissist. But when the show started, I was talking about some changes that the president was making to the official bios of various presidents throughout history related to uh, himself so that he was saying, well, this president did this. And that's sort of like when I did this. And it struck me as somewhat self-centered and narcissistic. And I was talking about it. And your your regular producer, Tom Jenkins, was looking at me and he had that look in his eye. You know, <laughs> yeah, I know that look. <laughs> you know, the look like, really, do you hear yourself? And, I, and it struck me that here I am, a guy who has a show named after himself complaining about other people being a narcissist. So Tom put together some promos for that. And it's uh, sort of stuck. So I just roll with it because, you know, the the great thing about what I get to do every day on the radio is that I, I get to just enjoy life in public and i think right. that's uh i think that's a real that's a real difference for me that's a real change for me because so much of my life as a chiropractor professionally and then also as a as a guy running for office was about putting on a front right. by about being a certain thing that other people expected you to be not that there's anything wrong with that but it's uh, it's very freeing to be in a position to be yourself well, and being yourself is what I want to talk about now because I haven't known you for very long, but I am so impressed and I don't think our listeners have any idea who you really are. So today, let's go back to you're really a doctor, which surprised me. I am. Yeah, it's funny because when I was a little kid, I always wanted to be a doctor. I can remember very little about my childhood, but the one thing I definitely remember is that I wanted to be a doctor. And the funny thing is my mom would always, whenever I would say that, my, my parents, wonderful folks, always very positive and reinforcing, high standards, but always very positive and reinforcing. My mom would just say, I'd say, I want to be a doctor, and I'd just hear somewhere off in the distance, chiropractor. Mm. Because she had a, an accident when she was a young teenager, a horse riding accident, and was paralyzed. And it really? was a chiropractor who brought her back. So Amazing. she wanted, our par- my parents always said, you can be anything you want. But they also provided gentle nudges. That was one of them. And then when I was 13, I experienced a football injury that did not resolve well under medical care. So I went to the chiropractor and had my first experience there. And I was fascinated when he took the x-rays and put them up on the screen and he drew all these lines on it and he showed me what was going on inside my body. I said, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be. So I knew at that point that I wanted to be a chiropractor. And over the next several years, I went to work as an intern in his office. And when we say intern, uh, right here in in Nicholson, Pennsylvania, when we say intern, what what that means is that I swept the floors (laughs) and I wiped down the tables. You know, I did all of those menial tasks. But the opportunity that it afforded me to see and understand what real life was like as a professional, as a doctor of chiropractic, motivated me through the many years of training and school. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a really great experience, a great opportunity for me. And I, I always recommend that young people, whatever the profession is that they're looking for, spend some time in that kind of environment. Because it really, it's different than watching a TV show. You realize that, yeah, there's a fair amount of drudgery in any 
uh, profession, but if you still love it, if you still enjoy it, then it's probably probably right for you. Well, I see the excitement in your eyes. You still love it. I you do. You still enjoy it. I see I that. I do still. I do still love uh, chiropractic, and it's kind of a sad. It's kind of a sad evolution of my life, but one which I found and made peace with. When I was 16, I went away to undergraduate school and finished my undergraduate work at 19, went to graduate school and graduated at 22 from New York Chiropractic College. I was the youngest in my class b- below the median age by about 10 years. Uh, most of the my colleagues were in their 30s when they were graduating. And I opened my first practice right in the back mountain in 1992. It seems like forever ago. Mm. And I loved it. I enjoyed so much the look in people's eyes, the feeling that I got when I was interacting with them, when I was helping them to dig down and, like the title of your show, make a change. Right. Because really, that's primarily what I was focused on with my patients. I wanted to help them see the world in a different way. I wanted to help them experience the empowerment of taking control of their own health care. So whether that was food, whether that was exercise, whether that was posture, uh, or even mental health and, and the state of mind, it was really important to me to connect with people. And so I set up my practice in a way that really engaged people, that got we got to spend a lot of time together. The problem with that was in 20 years, I never really figured out how to make it all that profitable. Uh, it was great fun and very rewarding. But I never really achieved any significant measure of financial success. Didn't matter, though, because I got out of it what I needed to get out of it. I don't think that's what people think. I think they think just because doctors, before your name, you're making all kinds of money. Of course. And, you know, that's part of what I was talking about at the beginning of the show about, you know, pretending to be something. You know, that people have an image of you and you don't want to disrupt that image too much because it's important to the relationship. Um, And I'm not sure that if I had it to do all over again, I wouldn't have been a little more transparent, Um, you know, in terms of meaning. Well, just where I was at and what I was feeling, because I always felt it was my duty to be there for my patients. I didn't recognize, perhaps, that they were also willing to be there for me. And if I had been a little bit more transparent about what what it was like and what I was going through, it might have had a different outcome. Uh, It also probably would have helped if I had focused on the financial aspect of it, which I which I never really did. But all in all, it was a terrific experience, and I miss it uh, because it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of it's very rewarding to have a, a little old lady come in in her seventies who put her arms up in the air and said, "My doctor told me I could never do this," you know, mm-hmm. in the waiting room. But you you made it happen, Doctor mm-hmm. Madeira. It was very rewarding, very a lot of fun. Well, as soon as my five children were born, every time within the first six weeks, I brought them to a chiropractor. And, and from reading all about it my whole life, whether this is true or not, and I guess I won't put you on the spot, but they say if your blood is free flowing, and that's one of the things that the chiropractic does so that it helps... In fact, I never even got their baby shots for yeah. any of them because I believed in chiropractic so much. So I'm saying, I, no, I'm, no, and, I'm just and totally I do, excited about And I do too, and, and it's something that's still a very much a part of my life. I don't practice actively anymore, uh, which is kind of a sad story because it came about as a result of changes in the industry. And I think it goes to some of the challenges we face as Americans, some of the things that I talk about every day on the radio show. The word doctor means teacher. And I always saw myself in that role. I always felt that it was my responsibility to help my patients learn more about themselves and about what they could do to change their lives because I recognized that was incredibly empowering. Yes, I could help somebody who came in with back pain. I could get them out of pain pretty quickly with a couple of adjustments, maybe some therapies. But it was helping them to understand that they could change their lifestyle in such a way as to dramatically reduce the chances that they would have a recurrence of that, to me, that was incredibly empowering. And yes, uh, like you, yeah, like you, we've got six children, and all of them have uh, never had shots, and they get regular chiropractic care, and they're healthy and robust because we're focused not just in terms of their chiropractic care, but their nutrition and their spiritual life in maximizing their potential by removing impediments, whether that's a subluxation or a bad diet or the wrong kind of thoughts, because as you well know, those kind of negative thoughts can take a person who's got a ton of potential and just grind them down until mm-hmm. they just give up. They have no no hope. So the sad part and the sad day that you decided to stop being a doctor, how did that 
come about? Well, what had happened was I was president of the State Chiropractic Association in the early 2000s. I had been actively involved here in the Wyoming Valley, founded the Wyoming Valley Chiropractor Chapter. We did a lot of public good stuff, like we did poster contests and physical fitness contests, things like that, to bring the community together around healthcare. And some of my colleagues said, why don't you take the same things you're doing here and the things you're doing in politics, because I was always involved in politics, and take them to Harrisburg for the profession. And so I volunteered to serve on the board and I joined the Chiropractic Association at the board level and I began to see dysfunction at that level. Right. And so I applied what I'd learned with my patients and from chiropractic school and tried to bring peace and unity and smooth functioning at the state level. And we were very successful. We had a dramatic increase in the number of chiropractors who were members of the State Chiropractic Association. We were growing and thriving. We were accomplishing things for the profession. And I was very excited about that. And that's when the what they call uh, HIPAA, the Health Insurance right. Portability and Accountability Act, was being implemented. It had been passed like eight years prior. But in the early 2000s is when doctors had to wrestle with it. Mm -hmm. And that was a transformative experience for me. Because I saw the future. While I was there, I came in to the presidency with an agenda. I said, here's the things I want to accomplish. I want to increase our educational standards. I want to expand our practice parameters so that we can do more to help our patients. And I want to dramatically elevate the public's perception of this profession that I know and love so well. And we were moving towards that. And then suddenly, this government mandate came down. And suddenly, the resources of the association, which we were really moving towards dedicating to all of those broad and powerful goals, was redirected to compliance. Mm -hmm. And in city after city across Pennsylvania, I stood in front of a room full of doctors, chiropractors, who were really the most engaged of all in the profession, because that's why they were there. And I was providing them with continuing education. But the continuing education was not about how to learn new skills. It was not about how to diagnose conditions or treat patients better or identify illnesses or paths to recovery it was not about any of those things it was about paperwork mm. it was about how to be more quote compliant and that broke my heart because i didn't see us as a compliant profession chiropractic was not founded in compliance chiropractic grew out of a rebellion against the establishment system. And I remember when a lot of chiropractors couldn't even take insurance. We couldn't use our insurance. And then that has changed drastically, though. But, oh, just I can't imagine everything you had to keep fighting against. Yeah, well, so we're doing these educational seminars all across the state. And we're doing one in Harrisburg one week. And then two weeks later, we have one scheduled in Pittsburgh. We put together the curriculum and the we had a big three-ring binder with all of the compliance stuff in it in Harrisburg. But we couldn't print the ones for Pittsburgh until just a few days before because the rules were changing so fast. And in city after city, I'm standing in front of these groups of doctors, their heads all down, their pencils upright, and they're writing away, trying to figure out how to, you know, which side of the envelope the name can be on or how you can do a sign-in list at the front. And I'm thinking, this is, this is not good. This is not good for our country. Right. And it was that experience that started me moving down the path towards an even more intense political involvement where I said... If I'm going to stop this, if I'm going to save chiropractic for the next generation, one of the things I've got to do is I've got to get more involved at the state level, even more involved than being president of the State Chiropractic Association. So that's when I decided to run for state senate. Now, I was still in full-time practice, but I ran for the state senate in 2006 uh, as a result of that HIPAA experience. I said, we've got to have people in there who understand what it's like to actually comply all right, well, let's take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, we'll have more with David Madeira. He does mornings here uh, at 6 to 9, weekday mornings here on 94.3 FM, The Talker. Of course, if you have any questions, check out MadeiraClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I, Clinicals.com. Or feel free to give Terry a call at 866-646-3374. This is Make a Change with Terry Martin on 94.3 FM, The Talker. We'll be right back. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. I mean, think about it. When you knew you looked good, 
You walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get that confidence you need with Madari Clinicals. They are a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madari Clinicals gives you that confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madari Clinicals. Check out MadariClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com. Or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Madari Clinicals. Well, welcome back to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I'm Terry Martin, your host, and D.C. Taylor, my producer. Before the break, we were discussing with David Madeira his decision to run for Senate, along with still being a doctor, working full-time. I I mean, how could you even possibly do all that? Well, you know, the the, uh, neat thing about it was that the Lord brought a team of people around me to help. And I think that's a really important part of any change is the support that you get from the people around you. I had made the decision as a result of prompting from my wife. We were sitting at an event in 2004 and we were celebrating the success of the profession. This was in Harrisburg and we were talking with some people who had been involved in helping the Chiropractic Professional Association to really come together. And former Lieutenant Governor Mark Single said to me, you should run for office sometime. And I laughed and I said, no, I've been in practice for 10 years and I've accomplished, well, more than 10 years, and I've accomplished the things that I wanted to for the profession here. Now it's time for me to go back and to work on my practice and focus on my family. And uh, my wife gave me a little elbow, which at first I interpreted to be, yeah, you got it right. No more volunteering. And uh, she said, no, I think you should reconsider. I think you should think about what he's saying. And I've learned over the years how important it is to listen to my wife, <laughs> not not to avoid nagging, but because my wife has, well, senses that I don't have. Mm-hmm. She's able to pick up on things that I don't pick up on. I'll be in a room. We'll be talking. We'll leave. And my wife will say, I'm not sure that guy's a good guy or I'm not sure that lady is a good person. And I'll be like, what? I didn't see anything. And then later on, I see it play out. So I've learned. It's taken me a long time, but I've learned to pay attention to my wife. So I began to scope it out and to begin to have some of the conversations, the early conversations about it. And I realized it was an uphill struggle, but an experience happened to me as I started to pursue this that led me to believe that this was the path that God wanted me to take. I was in Pike County and I was visiting with one of many people that I was meeting with as I was sort of investigating this, doing my exploration of the concept. And I sat across the table from this elderly gentleman, probably in his early 70s, And for 45 minutes, he just grilled me with questions, policy, tough policy questions, things that I hadn't necessarily even thought about. And so I was really under the firing squad. And Mm -hmm. I thought about 30 minutes into this, Terry, I said to myself, if I have to win every vote with this much ever, I'll never get elected because here I was under this intense scrutiny. About 45 minutes into the conversation, he pulled out a binder. And in the front of the binder, right across the front of the binder, it said David Madeira for state senate. He had been studying me, and he had put together a plan. He was a retired New Jersey state senator, and he put together a campaign plan for how I would win the election. And it really was an amazing experience (laughs) because the, the 45 minutes leading up to it was really intense. But I also knew from our conversation that this was a guy I could trust. Because he was asking the same questions I would have asked if I was on the other side of the table of a candidate. And he said, I want to run your campaign. And I said, okay, tell me a little bit about yourself. Because all I knew was that there was this guy who wanted to meet me. And he told me his story of making a change. He was working in the trucking industry. I love that. Making a change? uh, (laughs) Yes. he He was working in the trucking industry. And the industry was under a lot of stress. 
and the unions were unwilling to make concessions, management were un unwilling to work out an agreement for this one facility in New Jersey. And he kept telling the workers, look, if you don't make a change, if you don't make a concession, the union isn't going to matter because the company is going to close this plant down. I've been at the administrative meetings. I've seen the tables. They're looking at this facility as a liability, not an asset. And the more you push for, the more likely you are to be out of a job. And he said they eventually did shut down the plant and all went home and he had lost his job. But he decided that he wanted to make a change and he ran for state Senate successfully. He ran against the odds, strong conservative Republican in a very liberal Democrat district in Bergen County, New Jersey. And he won to the surprise, to the shock to the confoundment of everybody in the political scene. And I said, well, if there's anybody who can help me make a change, if there's anybody who can help me make a difference, this is the guy. And so we worked together and he really taught me everything that I know about the practical application of day-to-day -day politics. So it wasn't just him though, it was my wife's incredible support and a number of people who came around me and said, we believe in what you're doing. And I think that's really important in any change in your life is to, gather around you the people who will support you in that decision because it's tough when you make a change now i was running my practice full-time and running for office uh, i had a lot of lead time i started well over a year in advance so i was able to put the pieces together methodically i didn't have much of a life in fact now that i think about it i haven't had much of a life since 2005 <laughs> uh, when i decided to run but i could see that what i was doing was giving voice to the concerns of a lot of people who felt like nobody really cared about them. Nobody really had their interests at heart. And it's funny because I'm asked a lot of times by young people who want to get involved in politics, what should I do? What, you know, what will prepare me appropriately for a career in politics? And I pause for a moment. I clear my throat <laughs> because I know they're not going to like what I have to say next. And my answer is anything else. Do anything else because public service is only really service if it's not a career. Public service is only really service if you have something that you bring to the table. And if your only life experience is going to college and coming home on the weekends to have mom do your laundry, you may not have the requisite experience to understand the impact of the policies you that can you're take pursuing. getting beat up <laughs> yeah that's right it's going through losing everything mm -hmm. like my family did it's going through the struggles of running a business of trying to figure out how are we going to make payroll this month because the revenues just aren't there people are holding off on paying the economy's tight and it's all those experiences that increase your sensitivity to what it is that regular people go through so my advice to anybody who's thinking about, quote, getting involved in politics is do something else significant for 20 years. Make make your life worth talking about, and then you'll have something to bring to the table. Then you'll be able to share that life with others. Yeah, I think you have to go through all kinds of defeats, just like I've had to do in Madari. And sometimes you don't understand why all these things just, you feel like this black cloud is hanging over your head. But finally what I realized, that maybe it was even in the Bible when I was reading it the other day, was that it's just preparing you for something bigger than you could ever imagine that is going to be put before you that you're going to have to do. It will happen. No, that is so true. And I can see that in my life as, as I was practicing full-time and also running for state senate and it was an uphill battle there were four other candidates in the race three of whom had far more political experience than i ever dreamed of all of them had been successful at getting elected they were popular among their constituents and they had campaign backers and money and all the things that it takes to make a, a good campaign i had none of that but what i did have was a real deep and abiding passion for what i believed would was the keys to making America great and, and the things that could make America great again. So it was the combination of this really awful experience at the Chiropractic Association and the connection of people around me who said, we want to we want to help you. We think you've got the right ideas and we want to get behind you that made that race possible. I lost, uh, which was uh, probably not all that devastating because nobody expected me to win anyway. So it, it was it was really more of a of a preparation, not that we didn't give it our all and, and do our very best. I think anybody who runs for office at some level has to deceive themselves into believing they can win. 
That's an important part of the effort because the hours are long. I remember towards the end of that Senate race in May of 2006 that I was sleeping maybe two, three hours a night. I was working my practice full time. I was out campaigning, speaking, writing, talking, doing radio interviews, all the things that go into campaigning, traveling over six counties. Um, And I I remember feeling like this constant buzz in the back of my head Mm. and 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 a sort of an inability to connect like with my actual surroundings because I was worried about the next thing. It was a weird, weird experience. And I think it's it's an unfortunate but necessary part of running for politics is that at some point you're really pushed to your limit in the campaign process. And it's one of the reasons why I have a high regard for anybody who (laughs) runs for office, regardless of their political philosophy or their background, because it is tough to run for office. Now, being in office... That's a different question. I haven't experienced that, so I don't have a lot of empathy for that. I I feel that uh, when you're going through all those hard times, like you say, it's all, I don't know if it's that God's watching you or people are watching you, but when you can handle that like it's a breeze, then I think that's when we get promoted to the next thing. Mm. And and if we don't handle every situation in the right way, we, we get don't get chance. promoted. <laughs> we get another chance. And that's what happened to me. Um, I got another chance to, to run in 2008. I considered running. And that's when I made the decision to leave the profession because I found... The chiropractic. Yeah. In 2008, um, I was thinking about running for U.S. Congress at the time. I'd run already in six of the 14 counties that were encompassed. So I now I had some background I, you know when i went to meet people it wasn't who are you it was oh you're the guy who came in second in that five-way race i liked this or that so you know i had some credibility that that uh, that it wasn't a, a graduate degree but it was at least an undergraduate degree in politics that gave me uh, an opportunity to move on and i saw more and more that the problems that i got involved with in 2006 the reasons that i got involved in the race were even more important And so in 2008, uh, I thought about running, wound up, though, finding another candidate who was also making a change in his life and was willing to get involved and step up and somebody I agreed with. And I thought, oh, this is an interesting opportunity because now I have a different question that I have to answer. I have to answer the question, is this about me or is this about the things I believe in? Because I I could have gotten Mm -hmm. in the race. I mean, anybody can get in any race and I knew how to do it. I knew the game much better than the guy that I would have been running against. But I had to ask myself the question, is this is this about the agenda that I want to advance? Because he shares my agenda or is it about me? And that was a that was an interesting internal discussion as I worked through and figured out, all right, he's actually got some built in advantages I don't have, namely finances. And he's going to pursue the same agenda I am. At least I believe that. Is this the right time for me to be in a supportive role? And so I took a I took a supportive role in his campaign, wow. and at the same time retired. That was a big step. Yeah, it was a, it was a real internal Hard. struggle because I had to figure out why am I in this? Am I in this for all the reasons I say when I'm on the campaign trail? That yeah, you know, I just want to make the world a better place and serve my community. Or did I want the power? Did I want the the ring? You know, as uh, as mm-hmm. J.R.R. Tolkien describes in Lord of the Rings. You know, did I want that ability to control? And so I think relinquishing that was an important part of my development as well. So about that same time, so you decide not to run again, and you decide at that time to let go of being a chiropractor yes, also. Yes, I, I knew that I could not do both effectively. I had run the state Senate race in 2006. I already knew what that looked like. I knew the devastation it, ha- it had on my business. And in retrospect, as I looked at it, I realized that my my second place performance was in part due to that. I mean, you simply there's only so many hours in a right. day and a campaign, especially towards the end, is a full time experience. So I had purpose that I would not run again or be involved again unless it was full time. And the opportunity was there and it made a lot of sense. So that change was actually leaving the profession, the decision between the practice that I was struggling to to re- resurrect because I had neglected it so much in my 2006 race. And the opportunity to work in the, quote, industry and take all the things that I'd applied and be paid well for them, that was not that hard of a decision. Uh, it was after that was over that the sort of the consequence of that decision <laughs> right. came to me because I no longer had a degree. And so I was faced with another one of those change moments where I had to say, 
all right, do I go back into this profession or do I continue to pursue this consulting that I was doing? And I, I looked at the state of the profession and I reminded myself of the reasons that I got out. And I met, actually met with other chiropractors and said, just tell me how things are going. You know, because I wanted to remind myself of what mm-hmm. it was like to be in that situation and decided that, uh, no, I needed to stay out. I needed to stay out of the chiropractic profession. And I wound up getting some great consulting opportunities. And wise guy that I was in 2008. Now, remember what was going on in the summer of 2008. Uh, we were coming up to the brink of the collapse. Remember, late September, the stock market collapsed mm-hmm. and, and everything fell oh, apart yeah. going into, I'm sorry, late August into September. Well, in June of 2008, I decided to team up with a good friend of mine and go into a consulting business in commercial real estate, providing a very specific service that was oriented towards helping people who owned large commercial real estate to offset taxes. It was a technical, complicated accounting thing called uh, cost segregation. And we looked at the numbers, we did the spreadsheets, we did all of the planning. So here I am making another change. Now I'm going into business consulting. And we were convinced that this was a great business. And in fact, it was. And I spent the next several months learning about it, getting educated, starting a a new again, learning about it and getting all geared up to go out and make a difference. And I had hundreds of thousands of dollars of contracts for millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars of property set up, ready to go in August of 2008. And then it hit. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, more with David Madeira. Does mornings here, 6 to 9 a.m., weekdays on 94.3 FM, The Talker. Of course, if you have any questions, check out MadeiraClinicals.com, M-E-D-E-R-I, Clinicals.com, or feel free to give Terry a call at 866-646-3374. This is Make a Change with Terry Martin on 94.3 FM, The Talker. We'll be right back. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. I mean, think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get that confidence you need with Madari Clinicals. They are a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Medary Clinicals gives you that confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Medary Clinicals. Check out MedaryClinicals.com. That's M E D E R I Clinicals.com or call 866 646 3374. Take on the world with Madari Clinicals. Welcome back to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I'm Terry Martin, your host, along with my guest, David Madeira. And before the break, we David was discussing the completely new business. So I'll let you. Pick yeah, up I from had there. Uh, well, I had just come off of running a successful congressional candidates primary race and uh, step back from that and a business friend of mine said hey there's this business i think could really be great so in june and july we got ourselves educated in august we started to go out and line up a book of business and it was really looking very profitable it was a business that helped people who are owned large amounts of commercial property to move the cost of the the portions of the building into the front end it's pretty technical but the idea is that they could reduce their taxes on on the profits that they made by offsetting them against the costs. The problem was that in September of 2008, the bottom dropped out of everything. And suddenly, all of these contracts we had lined up, ready to sign, ready to write checks for, said, you know what? Our biggest problem isn't tax write-offs for our profit. Our biggest problem is selling anything because we're Mm -hmm. in commercial real estate. We've got houses that are dropping in value precipitously, and we, uh, we struggled with that business for a number of months, trying to get it to be resurrected, hoping, thinking, like most people did, oh, well, this will turn around. Here we are five years later, and I think we're still experiencing some of that. But that was a really tough time in my life because I had walked away from this profession that I loved. And you let I, your license go. 
I let my license uh, go. I put it in receivership, so it was still available for me to get back out if I wanted. Oh, okay. I could go through the process of resurrecting it for, for about a five-year period. But um, I continue to remind myself of the reasons that I left that, mm-hmm. that they hadn't changed and that I didn't want to go back there. And so I got involved in other business consulting. I found whatever work that I could to keep things rolling. Now, during this process, uh, I continued to advance. Even as tragedy and difficulty came, new opportunities came. And even through all of the recession uh, in 2008 and 2009 and even early 2010, my opportunities continued to expand. I actually was able to fall up. As I like to say, and I remind Mm -hmm. people of Winston Churchill's quote, that success is going from one failure to the next with no loss of enthusiasm. And to me, that's sort of been the the mantra of my life is that, well, Mm -hmm. okay, that didn't work out, but what's the next opportunity? How can I make a difference somewhere else? Where, Where can I take these skills and talents that have come through this fire and make a difference? Well, how did your family handle this fire? Well, at that, that point, at that point, we were still okay, mm-hmm. but we recognized that, and this was early 2010, we'd just seen the passage of Obamacare, and we put out what, what we call a fleece, which comes from the Old Testament, the concept of putting out something and saying to God, this is impossible, so if this happens, then I'll know it's you. And we put out a fleece, and I won't discuss what that was, but it was important to us, mm-hmm. and it was unlikely. And it happened. And that fleece was, if this thing happens or doesn't happen, I'll run for Congress. It was 2010. The race that I had thought about participating in 2008 was even more important because the, the incumbent congressman was still there. And so we decided to run. Now, this was January of 2010. The primary was in May. So it was a very short window, right. far shorter than any candidate should ever seek to undertake. You really need a couple of years to prepare and do all the spade work if you're serious about running for higher office, but we felt like it was the right thing to do. So we went all in. We put everything on the line and we worked as hard as we could. And things seemed to be really coming together. Now I was an experienced politician. I'd run in a five-way race and come in second place. And all of those people were in this same district. I was an experienced political consultant with a victory under my belt. I was an experienced business consultant with some failures and successes that came out of that. And now I was running for U.S. Congress. Now I had a very different reception when I went places, when I had conversations, because these were people who now knew me for four or five years involved in the political process. So it was a very different game this time around. And things were going really well. My wife was handling all of the management aspects of our campaign. Unfortunately, my good friend John Scott, my mentor, who had led me through that first race, was dying during the campaign and he died Mm. three days before the race was over Uh. Uh, it's funny story because john was never one to mince words he was always very tough and especially on me and he hated my ties he said they were because i wore kids ties i wore like you know veggie tails ties and fun ties he said no you're running for a serious office you need to present a serious face i said well look i've let you shape a lot of the things that i do but these are my ties that my kids like and that's what i'm going to wear because first and foremost i'm a dad he and had a, a good stroke. one at that he had a stroke and he was laying on the hospital bed in new jersey and i went to see him the weekend before the election now the interesting thing about john was that i knew when i went to see him that if there was any cognizance of what was going on around him at all he would be angry with me Because it was the weekend before the election, and I shouldn't be wasting my time visiting someone in the hospital. I should be out getting votes, because that was how dedicated he was. He was unable to speak. But when I came in and I stood next to him, and I filled up with tears, and my wife filled up with tears, and a tear came to his eye as well as he saw us walk into the room, he couldn't speak. And I said, look, John, I'm not going to stay long. I know you want me to get back out of the campaign trail, but I had to come and see you and tell you that we're praying for you. And with the little bit of strength that he had left, he reached up and he grabbed my tie and he pulled on it to scold me because I was wearing an unprofessional tie. I thought you were going to say that because he was in the hospital, you got the kind of tie he wanted you to wear. No, no. No. I'm a little bit of an independent streak when it comes to that. But that's the kind of friend that he was, uh, that he was able to, in that moment, still make a joke, still connect. Uh, with the situation a good a good friend and i miss john dearly uh went on 
And the thing I didn't tell him in that meeting, because I knew it would break his heart even more, was that that was Saturday. We knew by that time that the 39,000 piece mailer that was the crux of our campaign was not going to get delivered. There had been a mix up at the Philadelphia post office. The guy who brought it from whatever one of these delivery services didn't fill out the paperwork right. So it wound up sitting in the Philadelphia post office. Now, we didn't know that for sure. But what we did know was that in 14 counties with over 200 volunteers, not a single person had received this mailer. And it was a great mailer. It had a picture of the family and it had the right messages. It was just perfect for the campaign. So my wife and I looked at each other at that moment. And without saying a word, we both decided in our hearts that we would never mention that we thought that the race was lost. Because there were so many people who were dependent on us that we felt like it was important for us to maintain the encouragement. We had, it was a rainy Tuesday Mm. in May. And we had, I think, over 100 people manning the polls all throughout the day, working so hard, standing out in the cold rain, working the election. And our hearts were broken because we knew that it was very unlikely, outside of an act of God, that we would win. And yet, all these people had given so much. And so we couldn't, we just couldn't give up. We had to do Mm -hmm. the right thing. And that night we lost. We won big in all of our home counties. But overall, in the 14 counties, we lost came in second place and did you know the the whole mental thing why god why would you why would you bring us this close to success why would you put us in a position to have all of this here right in front of us and then take it away it was the worst two weeks of my life because there's something else <laughs> well and that's <laughs> why and that's what i found out because it was shortly after that that two things happened to me number one uh, i was given an opportunity to do radio Now, my brother, uh, Tim Madeira, has WRGN radio and has been doing radio since he was 16. He's the radio guy. He's the guy with the deep, resonant voice and the talent. And and I was, you know, I was just the the egghead brother who was heavily involved in politics. And when the offer came to me, when the opportunity came to me, I thought, I'd like to try that. I think I think I'd like to try that. And so I, I took the opportunity. And on August 14th of 2010, I started the David Madeira show on 94.3 FM The Talker. It was a Saturday show. And the very first show we did was the story of the Liberty Tree, which is a tree in Boston that the Sons of Liberty had gathered around to plot the overthrow of the tyranny that they were experiencing in the colonies. And my brother Tim, in fact, was the one who shared that story with me. I said, I'm looking for a name. I want to have a hook for this. I want it to be something memorable. And he said, well, do you know the story of the Liberty Tree? So I read the story and I said, that's perfect because I could see radio as that tree. The, tr- the, the Liberty Tree was a, just a, an elm tree or a pine or whatever in a little town, Boston or any other community in New England, where the Sons of Liberty would meet to talk. It was illegal. It was treason mm. to talk about exercising your rights outside of what the king said. But these men... Average men, ordinary men, candlestick makers and lawyers and doctors and butchers all met and they would raise a little flag in the tree. And when the flag was up, you knew that the guys who were standing around under the tree were plotting liberty. And to me, that's what talk radio was. So we started on the 235th, I think, anniversary of the day they cut down the liberty tree and we began the show and we've been doing it ever since. Did that for about two years on the weekends and then also started the daily show here back in may of 2012 and i i jokingly say that i think i may have found what i want to do with the rest of my life uh, i've changed when careers you grow up. <laughs> yeah i've changed careers what six seven times in the last five years because that's what necessity forced on us one of the challenges that that no it was a training that you needed in each one of those indeed it was so Indeed, None of them were mistakes. Yeah, one of the challenges that we faced shortly after I started the weekend show was that I had no income. I had walked away from all of my business opportunities to run for Congress, and uh, we basically were completely out of money. Uh, we ultimately wound up losing our house in Dallas uh, to oh. foreclosure. Learned some things since then that I might have been able to save it, but at the time we didn't. And I wound up taking a job in Pittsburgh. I had to leave the area, which this is where I've always known. This is where I've always wanted to be. 
but I had to leave the area. I always tell my kids, they'll say, why did we move to Pittsburgh? I'll say, because that's where God put the food. And we all mm-hmm. wanted to eat. <laughs> so we went there. And I think that's an important lesson about making a change is that changes aren't always what you want. Right. Sometimes they're driven by necessity. But there's always an opportunity in that moment to learn something, to do something. And sometimes if the only opportunity is away, then away it is. And you go and you pursue and you, you do the best that you can. And you learn the word trust. Indeed. <laughs> that is so hard. Indeed. Well, David, it's time to take a quick break. And when we come back, let's talk about your little teaser, what you want to be when you grow up. All right. I'll okay. be happy to. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. I mean, think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get that confidence you need with Madari Clinicals. They are a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madari Clinicals gives you that confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madari Clinicals. Check out MadariClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com. Or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Madari Clinicals. Welcome back to Make a Change on 94.3 FM. The talker and along with myself today, I have David Madeira as my guest. And before the break, we were discussing... What David wants to be when he grows up. But on top of that, I just want to throw something else in there that says not only what he wants to be when he grows up, but for people listening, what would you say to someone who's thinking about making a career change in the middle of their life? Well, I'll start with the first one. What okay. do I want to be what I, when I grow up? Um, because that kind of is a, f- a fun question and one which reflects the way I approach life. Um, I had an uncle, and he was just a great guy, and he was very successful in New York and New Jersey in business, and he was the uncle that when we went to his house, I looked around in amazement and said, wow, when I grow up, you know, this is what I want. I want to be successful like him, and he used to jokingly say that what he really aspired to be was a beach bum, <laughs> that, uh, that all he really wanted to do was, uh, was just spend time alone on the beach and sailing and and doing fun things but he recognized that he had a an obligation to the people around him and i think there's a a tension that is always in our lives there's the side of us that wants to just enjoy you know whatever's going on around us and then there's the side of us that recognizes well we have a responsibility no man is an island we have an obligation to find a way to help the people around us and so i think i've struggled with that tension all my life on one hand wanting to pursue things that were stable and secure and give my lovely bride and six children a, you know a good successful financially life and on the other side a recognition that all of that can be gone in an instant it just can get blown away by circumstances that are outside of your control that's where i found myself in 2008 and then again in 2010 as we left northeastern pennsylvania for work in pittsburgh and that was a great and exciting opportunity I had a friend who had been a friend since I was very young who said to me, I've got this business doing branding and marketing, and I think your skill set would be great for coming up with ideas for our clients about how to grow their business and tell their stories. And I connected with that and the paycheck because it made sense to keep feeding the kids. They were all for that. So we moved to Pittsburgh, Mm -hmm. uh, left everything, literally everything behind and walked away from it all while we were there. Um, because the finances were so tight, and and God bless my wife, what an amazing woman she is to stand by me through all of this. She wound up selling all of her jewelry and all of her clothes and most of our furniture because uh, finances were so tight, and then she went to work at a hotel. Can I say something? What I feel and I'm hearing right here is that you will do what it takes. You are so willing to give of yourself, and I see such self-sacrifice for the both of you, and I do not see any selfishness. So... I just had to put that in there. So my wife went to work at a hotel 
changing sheets and cleaning rooms uh, because that was what she was able to find at that time. It was a very difficult economic time. And because she'd made the decision to stay home and raise our kids, a lot of times her degree and her life experience weren't valued at the employers that she went to. But rather than, you know, go in the fetal position and suck our thumbs or cry Mm -hmm. and whine and say, woe is me, the world is unjust, she said, all right, well, I can get a job at a hotel. And she worked her way up very quickly uh, in the hotel. She distinguished herself as being focused on service. And I was so proud the one day when a guy went through her hotel who was doing Uh, He was one of these stunt drivers for like driving ATVs and jumping and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. So he was on tour and he was staying at the hotel and he wrote on his blog a story about my wife as the example of the perfect servant. Because here she was cleaning rooms. He was in the lobby. She came up to him, tried to help him understand, you know, where he was at and what his needs were. And she helped him. And he wrote this story. He said, you know, this is what it makes America great. It's people like Melanie. Mm -hmm. who are willing to serve whatever. And what he didn't know was that at the time she was also going through a terrible physical time because she was exhausted from all of the work and that we'd lost everything. She didn't communicate any of that to him because she was there to serve him. And in in return, he appreciated and recognized that. So it it was going through all of those experiences. And then when the station asked me to come back and do the daily show and do the morning drive show, um, I recognized that that was the next evolution in that process and i don't know what i'm going to be when i grow up what i do know is that every day i'm faced with some kind of an opportunity and i can seize that opportunity i can make the most of that opportunity or i can say well i don't feel like i'm ready or this isn't fair or this isn't what i planned and what i know what i trust is that god has planned it for me and that he's he knows what's around the corner i don't And rather than getting anxious or frustrated or saying, this isn't what I expected, I say, all right, what do I need to learn here? What do I need to do to grow to the next step? How do I how do I get ready for the next opportunity? Say, boy, I hope I I pass that last test because I don't want to have to go through any of this again. Yeah, but I think we do. I mean, I think when I look. Yeah, a new trial. I think we do. It's Mm -hmm. like a spiral. We go through it again and again. And there is a recognition. You know, people say, well, you know, have you found what you want to do? Yes. Yes, definitely. And there's nothing I've ever done. You enjoy everything. But there's nothing I've ever done in my life that I enjoy more than doing radio. There's just nothing. I've, this is so much fun. I joke and say that it's you know therapy, but it's so much fun. Otherwise, why would I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning? And you know, if the listeners could see you, you are so enthusiastic. You don't just sit here and read from a script or anything that I see. You're, you're bouncing and you're excited and you take news that regular newscasters on even television or any other station that i see uh where it's doom and gloom but you take that doom and gloom and you give it a a hope for us so that's why i think your show is so good well thank you i appreciate that and i i do i have a great passion for what's going on in the world and trying to understand it and then explain it and to me that's a, that's really what my talent is so where that takes me, I don't know. One and it of the really things, helps me because I don't understand a good share of it, and I'm sure many of our listeners don't. One of the things that I've learned is to hold all of that lightly. That uh, what I think I have, what I think is mine, what I think is my future, m- may not be. So I think holding it lightly is very important. Now, you asked me one other question that I did want to make sure that I answered, and that is, what, what would I tell people who are thinking about making a change? You know, what would my advice to them be? And I think the first the first step would be to spend some time in prayer and really try to find out what Very God good. wants you to do. Because I really think you don't know. Mm-hmm. You think you do. I mean, I thought from the time I was six that I knew what I wanted to do with my life. And it wasn't that any of that was wasted. It was valuable to me and to all the people who interacted with me. You just didn't have to do it for the rest of your life. But it wasn't a life decision, <laughs> right. right? It was that decision for that moment in time. So spend some time in prayer and ask God to help you to understand what what is your purpose? What do you want me to do? And then explore. Look around. See what the opportunities are. And don't limit yourself. You, you have a terrific story about this, about finding yourself in a place in the middle of your life where you thought, this is not what I planned. This is not right. Many times. <laughs> and and you said to yourself, okay, what are the opportunities that come from this? So some time in prayer, finding out you know what God wants. And I'm trying to remember who said this, but uh, it was a it was a English evangelist who said that he prayed 
until he got to the place where, and he'd make lists of all the good and all the bad. And he said, I kept praying and making lists of all the good and bad of each opportunity until I got the place to where I had no will of my own. Whichever way it went, I could be okay with. And then I would get my answer. I would know, you know, what I needed to do. But consult with and work with the people around you. You know, consider the impact on them. My, I mentioned my wife, what a great woman she is to put up with me and all of these career changes. All of my kids who have been so patient, who now that my wife is running for state representative, have gathered around her and they go out on the weekends and they knock on doors and try to get people engaged in her campaign. And then during the week, they go to work and they contribute some of their income to our family budget so she can dedicate her time to the campaign. And I think that part of that grows from the fact that Years ago, back in 2010 and 11, when we had nothing, they saw her get up early in the morning Mm -hmm. and go to work all day and come home and help them with their homeschooling and all the things that were involved with that. They saw that example of selflessness in my wife and said, now when they're in a position to make a decision, they saw that role model and they say, all right, we want to be a part of that. You've invested in us. We want to invest in you. And I think that's very that's a very powerful part of making a change is not what's in this change for me, but what's in this change for the people around me. When I make this change, when I do this new thing, whatever it is, how can I help the people around me? Because when things don't go well, that'll sustain you. That'll keep you going. When I met Melanie and your family, I could see the very good job you did. It doesn't matter what you have gone through. I mean, it does matter, but not in the way that your children have suffered in any way they have not if anything i think they were the best examples that they could have ever had because they are wonderful they i I just can't believe not that i'm trying to make you feel good but to take six children and put them at this dinner that i was at with your wife and your you know her whole situation that she's in for running uh they were so well behaved and when they stood up to speak you know it just was amazing so it doesn't matter. To me, uh, in life, our families and memories and the, the good things that our children become is everything. So that is already your biggest success story that yeah. I've seen. Well, thank but, you. They are. I, I do consider, uh, and my wife as well, we consider our children to be our most important investment. And you can see it. And we really have always worked really hard. When we got married, we made the decision not to raise good kids, but to raise good adults. We recognize that every step that we take along the way has to be looked at in terms of that longer term thing where are they responsible? Do they understand their role in the community? Are they willing to to step up to the plate when that's needed? Are they willing to put themselves second and, and help others? And all of that really is a big part of being prepared for change because you know what? It's a dangerous world and we don't know what's going to be around the corner, all this stuff in the Middle East and ISIS and terrorism and our southern border. It's a scary time. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to need in the next 10 years is young people who have instilled in them values that were given to them by their parents who lived those values, not just pursuing the next opportunity, but pursuing it in a way that considered everybody's needs. And they're going to be what, what I think is going to be referred to many years hence as the greatest generation, our kids. Because if we've prepared them properly, they'll step up and they'll solve the problems that that we didn't. Well, their politeness is what very much shocked me because as they were walking around the room, it isn't that uh, mother and father could follow them around, make sure that they said everything right and that they were that, that they were just the best behaved, but they were. And the way that they spoke was just amazing. And I'm not the only one that was sitting there saying, Look at the good job that you have done with your children. Well, that's mostly my wife. <laughs> I, was, I was working most of the time. Well, she was working too. So I think she when was. she was working, you were she doing, was. you know, you both Indeed. just did such a good job. Indeed. Thank you. But David, I, I very much appreciate you coming on the show this week and uh, trying to help people make a change because I think many people might hear you on the show and just think your life has been oh, like, smooth sailing, all easy stuff. Yeah. And you're just showing people that don't be afraid to make a change. Indeed. And it, it's a, your journey. It's a, it's, don't be afraid to just step out there, right or wrong, just to start stepping out there and doing something. But that's it for the show this week on Make a Change. And in 
Again, I just want to thank you for joining us today. I'm Terry Martin, and any questions you may have, feel free to call me at 866-646-3374 or check out MadariClinicals.com for more information. Talk to you again next time on 94.3 FM The Talker. Have a great weekend, and thanks for listening. Thank you, David.